Well, hey there, schmoopers, and welcome back to Insex Appeal. Chances are, if you live in the southeast U.S., you've probably heard the news of an invasive species of Japanese giant spider spreading rapidly throughout northern Georgia and into South Carolina. But is there any significance to this spider's spread? How did they get here, and what should we even do about them? Today, on Invasive Infestations, the giant Joro spiders rise in North America. This year in 2021, we've seen a massive explosion of the so-called Joro orb weavers here in North Georgia. As you've probably heard about through social media, news reports, or stumbled upon them yourself if you live in the area. I myself began to encounter them at work last year as they began to spread across Lawrenceville and Duluth, and soon realized they were not at all the yellow argyopes and golden silk orb weavers I was used to seeing around. Though the population boom of the Joros has gained more media attention this fall, the species was actually first reported apparently as far back as 2013, with their presence being confirmed in 2015 in Georgia, where they have gone on to spread and become fully established in the region, with their range covering more ground every year, now known to extend into South Carolina. But how did they get here, and what does that mean for the native ecosystem? Well, first, let's get to know these juicy Joros a bit better. The Joro spider, or Joro orb weaver, Trichonophila clavata, are impressive large spiders native to Japan, Korea, eastern China, and Taiwan. They are known for their huge three-layer webs made of an extremely strong yellow silk, which they of course use to capture flying insects. The name Joro in Japanese actually means girl, and their traditional name, Jorogumo, literally translates to woman spider. This name reflects the species' very obvious sexual dimorphism, with the males being small, scrawny, and various shades of oranges and browns, while the females are much larger, with bright yellow abdomens with grayish green or blue stripes and a dazzling red patch on their ventrums. These spiders are also revered in Japan for their size, beauty, and proficiency in catching harmful insects in their webs. They are even featured in Japanese folklore as the Joroguma, a yokai who appears as a beautiful woman with fire-breathing spiders at her command. This spider demon is said to seduce young men in order to lure them into her web, where she binds and devours them alive. Despite the impressive size and beauty of the female Joro spiders, they actually have a short life cycle that lasts about a year. Hatching in the spring, the Joro spiderlings parachute and spread all around using their silk to float on the wind. The females go on to grow and build impressive webs, some becoming quite large come autumn. During this time, the much smaller, weaker males abandon their own webs and take to the skies once again, gliding on silk balloons to find a gorgeous gal's spacious web to live on. During this season, males are commonly found exclusively in females' webs, and sometimes even two to five males can be found living on the same web, where they coexist relatively peacefully and even eat meals with the dominant lady. Once mating occurs, the males may take off once again in the hopes of mating with more females before the season ends. But of course, like many spiders, if a big gal is hungry enough, she may devour daddy before he can head on out. But this seems less common in the Joro since they tend to stay well fed during this time. The female then builds an egg sac containing up to 1500 eggs and then fastens it to a tree or structure where the eggs will overwinter until next spring and the adults begin to expire as the cold sets in. Pretty amazing little beasties I must say but I am quite partial to spiders anyway. Now, back to our current invasion in good old Georgia, how did these fabulous foreigners come to arrive in the first place? Well, nobody is exactly entirely sure about that. The running theory and the one I find likely speculates that imported shipping crates from Japan or China being hauled up through North Georgia by truck helped to initially spread them. 
More than likely, some Joro back home set her egg sac up on the shipping container and it just so happened to hatch while cruising up Interstate 85. The first ever sightings in Georgia were reported in 2013 in Hodgson, from there spreading as far south as Duluth and Norcross and as far north as Blairsville and into western South Carolina as far as Greenville and possibly North Carolina. In coming years, it's likely that the spider's range will begin to spread further into more neighboring states. The spread goes relatively unchecked, as there doesn't seem to be any real plan in place by the Georgia state government to control the spider. While I'd like to preface the following to say that any invasive species is bound to have some negative effect on the new ecosystem eventually, what that might be for the Joros is not yet clear. Joro spiders prefer to densely populate areas of forests near ponds or lakes, but can be found alongside native common orb weavers as well. While their large cousins prefer to inhabit other habitats like tree lines, grasslands, and gardens, it seems there is no major competition between the Joro and the orb weavers native to Georgia, so that pressure so far doesn't seem to be an issue. In fact, the Joro living so densely populated with their large powerful webs actually makes them beneficial by removing huge numbers of potentially disease spreading mosquitoes as well as invasive pests like the prolific brown marmorated stink bug which I'll try to do an episode on soon. So if the state isn't trying to stop them and they don't seem to be harming the environment, what should we do about them? Well, at this point it's clear that nothing is going to stop the spread of these impressive spiders. They have few natural predators, are harmless to humans, and it'd be nearly impossible to eradicate the established population in any significant numbers at this point. So with that, you're welcome to kill them if you have them on your land since they are invasive, but please take care not to kill native orb weavers that belong here, mistaking them as Joros. But again, the Joros will just keep coming and if anything, they can be beneficial if left alone, so maybe we should just accept these new neighbors and let them be and hope that any unforeseen ripple in the ecosystem will be barely detectable at best. Whatever we do, it seems these critters are here to stay in the southeast. So I'll float off here. What do you think of these gorgeous spiders and their new residents in the southeast? Let me know down in the comments what other invasive arthropods you'd be interested in learning about. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. Like and subscribe, and if you feel like I deserve it, consider becoming a patron and help my channel grow. And as always, thanks a whole lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.